Uh, well, thanks, Kevin, and uh, thanks, Nash, for organizing this wonderful event and inviting me to be here. Um, yes, Nash had asked me to talk about problems and challenges of causal inference in network science and web science, and I'm going to talk about three challenges. Um, the first two probably everybody's very familiar with, and actually it's come up in conversations earlier today. Uh, unobserved heterogeneity is a problem of confounds when the heterogeneity is correlated with exogenous, with endogenous variables. Uh, reciprocal effects or feedback loops. Uh, and third, network autocorrelation, which is uh, what I'm going to focus on mostly because I think that's the, the, the challenge that's less well understood, although we've known about it for a long time. Um, so to begin, uh, unobserved heterogeneity, uh, I'm going to start with a, a, a simple example. Um, this is actually useful information for those of you who would like to live forever. Um, this is showing uh, changes in life expectancy and the per capita consumption of fat between 1970 and 1986, and you can see there's a positive relationship. Um, and in fact, um, it turns out that if you want to live to be 100 years old, you need to eat your body weight in fat each year. And that's assuming that your body weight stays constant. But if your body weight increases, you can actually live forever. And uh, so for those of you who uh, are impressed by this, uh, these are the fast food restaurants that we may be going to tonight for, for dinner. But uh, a somewhat more uh, serious example, well, we had an item today uh, that Luis presented uh, that degree homophily uh, is a byproduct of network modularity. Um, and another, uh, coming from a research team at Cornell, uh, studied joining behavior in LiveJournal and found that the, uh, uh, tested the effect of not just how many neighbors were in a community, but whether those neighbors were neighbors of each other. So compare A, B, and C who are not in the community, but who have one or more friends who are. A has one friend, B has three, but they're not friends with each other. C has three friends and they're friends with each other. And now the question is, who's more likely to join? And the answer is C. So the question is why? Why should it matter that the friends know each other? And so one possibility was suggested by uh, Vandalay and Goyal in a 2006 paper, which is that the, the uh, triad closure, the tie between I and J, could just be a proxy for the unmeasured effects of tie strength. And so if there are stronger ties from I to C and J to C, this allows greater influence. And so C is more likely to join the community uh, or adopt uh, the belief or the innovation or whatever. So um, uh, working with Nathan Eagle and Rob Claxton, we followed up this idea by um, uh, testing the adoption of a uh, a voicemail product on the uh, British Telecom network that was virally marketed, didn't have advertising. Uh, it was just marketed uh, through the network itself. And, um, and so we, we had call data from August of 2005. And uh, following the procedure um, in the live journal study, we looked at people who had one or more adopter friends at the beginning of the period. We wanted to see how their probability of uh, eventually adopting this technology would vary with triad closure controlling for tie strength, which we measured as frequency of, of interaction, basically call volume. And lo and behold, what we found is that, in fact, it's not an artifact of tie strength. Uh, so in this case, um, the, uh, the, this is not the explanation, that even after we controlled for, for tie strength, um, we still find an effect of triad closure uh, that's independent of that. Um, so this suggests, in fact, that the Baxter et al. study um, was, was not simply reporting a, a proxy for unmeasured effects. Uh, there's something else going on which still uh, we don't entirely understand. Uh, second challenge, reciprocal effects. Again, this is one that I think everybody's pretty familiar with. Uh, we see examples of this all the time. Um, but I'm going to just say a few things about it. Um, so one example of where this problem arises, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why Nash um, asked me to, to address this topic. Um, the relationship between, uh, between network location and uh, 
and economic remuneration. So Ron Bird um, has um, a theory which has been uh, repeatedly supported very, very consistently um, with, with data at the individual level, at the level of organizations, showing that nodes that bridge between clusters that are surrounded by structural holes tend to have higher remuneration. And so our question is, does this scale up to communities? And again, uh, this is working with uh, Nathan Eagle and Rob Claxton using uh, BT Call Graph from 2005, a network with uh, 65 million <coughs> nodes, 367 uh, million bi-directed edges. And we measured um, network diversity at the level of the community uh, by examining the structure of the ego networks of the members of the community. Um, and we used two measures, uh, the structural holes uh, that surround those, those members and the Shannon entropy in their distribution of call volume across neighbors and, and also across regions. Uh, we also measured economic development of the communities using a UK index, which is a composite of income, employment, health, crime, and environmental quality. And uh, here, here's what we found, a very strong relationship. Um, so as the, uh, the very similar to what, what Ron has found at the individual level, that as um, network diversity increases, so too does the uh, socioeconomic ranking of the community on this uh, UK index. But the question is, what's the causal direction here? Uh, and, uh, and in our paper, we, we raise that and we say that we're agnostic about it but we suspect that it runs in both directions. Um, that, that diversity promotes access to resources as has been uh, proposed originally by Granovetter but also by, by Ron Bird and others. But it's also possible that there are feedback loops in which mobility, whether it's spatial or social, um, also um, selects for, for uh, network structure. So, and both of these things could be operating um, uh, to reinforce each other. To tease this out, we really need longitudinal data, uh, which, um, which we may be able actually to obtain. But um, this next study uses longitudinal data. Uh, this is the Framingham um, uh, data that, uh, that Luis talked about this morning. And, uh, and in, this, um, in this data, the yellows are uh, obese, the greens are fit. And this is change in the network and in obesity, measured as BMI. Uh, over a 32-year period. Uh, this is uh, data made famous by, by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. And, uh, and, and by, because it's longitudinal data, they can tease out the causal directions. Uh, and what they find is that over this period, uh, there is clustering uh, such that you find uh, a cluster of obese nodes uh, in, in yellow, um, and you also find a cluster of fit nodes. So uh, why do you get this clustering of obesity? Well, in fact, th there could be causal uh, processes operating in both directions uh, in which uh, people are attracted to those with similar BMI um, and are more likely to interact with them, but then they're also influenced by those with whom they interact uh, to, to have similar uh, BMI, whether it's fitness or whether it's obesity. Uh, so that's one way to address this problem, is to have uh, longitudinal data and to be able to use the temporal order to tease out the causal directions. But I think the, real, the gold standard here for dealing with reciprocal effects uh, is a, c a controlled experiment. And, uh, and Damon Santola uh, has a paper from last year in which he found that there was a contagious property to fitness behavior, not obesity here, but fitness behavior, um, and that this contagion uh, depended on local network structure. So he was able to hold constant the network structure in order to measure just the, the contagious property. But the third challenge is the one I really want to focus on today, uh, and that's network autocorrelation, um, sometimes known as Galton's problem. Uh, we've known about this for a long time because, in fact, this was, I guess, the earliest uh, place where this was really uh, raised, uh, a, a, a presentation by, by Tyler in 1889 in which uh, he argued that uh, there were economic causes of the shift from, from matrilineal to patrilineal inheritance. And Galton objected that um, Tyler was assuming 
that his 350 uh, cultures that he was comparing were, 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 were all independent of one another. But in fact, there could have been cultural diffusion going on uh, that would also explain this relationship such that there is no real economic uh, consequence, there's no, there's no consequence of, of economic development for uh, these cultural patterns. So a more contemporary example, uh, and which is what I'm going to focus on, are the, uh, the contemporary uh, culture wars between the reds and the blues, the red culture and the blue culture. So the 2000 election, we think of that election as the closest in US history. I believe it is the closest in US history. Uh, Gore won by a, ver a razor thin margin, uh, half, of, uh, half a percent, uh, as you may recall. Um, but although it was almost a dead heat uh, nationally, uh, it's hard to find a precinct where it was close. Certainly it was not close in Ithaca. I doubt it was close in Evanston. Uh, probably not close in Salt Lake City or Orange County or lots of other places. So in fact, what was happening is that there were landslides almost everywhere. The winner was winning by a very substantial margin. So just they all canceled each other out. So for every one that, that Bush won, Gore won. Um, but in fact, it was not close locally. And uh, this is a 2008 election. Uh, this is a map developed by Mark Newman, um, both a, a spatial and a, a population cartogram, which, which, uh, which uh, is uh, also showing you the relative uh, populations of the areas that are blue and red, as well as purple. And, um, and again, this is showing uh, that a very large part of the country and a very large proportion of the population um, were red or blue, uh, not so much purple. And then a very famous uh, graph uh, from um, uh, Ottomich and Glantz, the 2005 paper in which they look at the, the, uh, the, the blues and the reds in the blogosphere. And again, we find the blues talking to the blues, the reds talking to the reds for the most part. So we have this thing that's, that's been called, commentators have called it uh, culture wars. It's polarization. If we think of polarization in a little bit different way than we sometimes do, sometimes people think of polarization as the tendency for people to take extreme positions. But that's not what, what I'm, uh, what, that's not what I mean by polarization. It's not just that they're extreme, it's that the, the, the opinions are correlated correlated with other opinions and also with demography. So what happens in a polarized population is that you can predict somebody's position on, on lots of issues if you know their position on any one that's highly salient. You know their position on gun control, you can figure out their position better than chance on same-sex marriage. <laughs> and this is true even when the positions are not logically consistent, as you see here. So, Reds are yes on uh, government regulation, in some cases no on others, and yet it's all highly predictable. So why does this happen? How does it, how does it come about that these opinions are correlated with one another and with demography? Um, and social scientists, and I think this probably has some relevance actually for, for Scott's uh, presentation, um, that when social scientists see polarization, and they see camps, and especially when they see the camps really fighting with each other, uh, and, and especially if they're fighting violently, uh, there's this temptation to think, well, they must have a reason. And so we want to look for uh, endogenous properties. We want to look for, for attributes of the members of these demographic groups, their interests, their historical identities, to, to try to explain why you get this pattern. Um, and, and these, these correlations on which these explanations are based assume, importantly, that the observations are independent. In other words, there's no homophily, there's no social influence, which of course is rarely the case. So an alternative explanation, and one that I think arguably is much more parsimonious, is network autocorrelation. And the idea here is that, in fact, people are not arriving at their opinions independently. Um, 
through both selection processes and influence, they're clustering. And, they're, and this can lead then to polarization of opinion and a correspondence with, de with, with demographic attributes. In other words, membership in a demographically de defined uh, profile. And so, uh, from this perspective, there's a tendency to say, well, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation, except that it's, it's accidental. And I'm, this is sort of a play on the concept of accidental influence that, that uh, Duncan Watts introduced. And the idea here is that we have accidental differences. Uh, so the claim is that with network autocorrelation, the pattern of polarization in which the blues are to the left and the reds are to the right Replay history could come out the other way. It's arbitrary. Uh, but since we only see one run, the one in which we're living, it acquires a sense of inevitability. But the question is, was it really inevitable? So to find out, uh, Andreas Flocka and I uh, did a computational experiment uh, in which it's a kind of a Gedanken experiment in which we have two groups, call them red and blue, and they have opinions on on some salient issues, uh, but we know the ground truth, and we can manipulate that. And we can make it that there is little or no difference intrinsically between the reds and the blues. And, uh, and then we can see what kinds of correlations we get uh, as the system moves from a random start into equilibrium. And um, the, model is, uh, it's a, the model we used is a Hopfield model. It's a member of a class of models uh, that includes icing models and POTS models. And it's, it's a model that combines influence and, and homophily. And in this model, um, th we, we, we assign each node three attributes. One binary demographic attribute, member in the reds or the blues, and two continuous opinions uh, that are just the weighted mean of the opinions of your neighbors weighted by the, the edge strength and the edge valence. And these edge valences, or weights, can range from minus 1, which is antipathy, uh, sort of in-group, out-group differentiation, to plus 1, where there's maximum similarity with somebody. And we use asynchronous updating of the weights and the states until the system moves to equilibrium, that is to say when nobody can influence or move their, uh, change their, their weights. And we start with various access graphs that can limit who can influence whom. Uh, so the one I'm going to show today happens to be uh, connected caves. Um, and it's 100, degree of 20. We have 5% of the ties are random, 2% are hubs. Uh, most of the triads are closed. Uh, the initial weights and opinions are random. And we then update. Uh, so the opinions change because of the influence of your neighbors. The weights change to reflect agreement and disagreement. And that's it. That's the model. Very simple, very stripped down, not meant to be all that realistic. It's really a thought experiment. And, uh, and we have sort of multiple worlds. We run the thing with multiple realizations uh, because we want to find out whether any one realization might be arbitrary. And that's a key part of, of the, the argument. So here are the results. And this is really the key the key thing that I want to show you today in this talk. So the ground truth here, there is no intrinsic difference between uh, the reds and the blues. There's none. And indeed, uh, on, the, on average, the correlation is zero, which is what it should be, or just a little below zero, which is what it should be. The only problem is there are almost no runs where it comes out to zero. In fact, it's a bimodal distribution where almost all the runs come out with really strong positive and negative correlations. They just cancel each other out, kind of like the 2000 election. But then notice what happens is that if we just tip the process very slightly, so there's a little tiny intrinsic difference between reds and blues. There's some interest or identity that independently of influence would still cause you to be more, have an opinion one way or the other, just a little tipping, and, and then what we get is the, 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 the system uh, moves very strongly in, in the direction of the tip. So that now most of the outcomes are coming out positive. We, we tip a little more, and now we're getting these very strong correlations 
over and over and over again, which means even if you replayed history any number of times, you would continue to always get that, that correlation in the same direction uh, as, as it's tipped. So what this shows is that even when there is no effect, you can get a false positive, and it can be very strong on any one realization which is the only one that we observe his, in, historically. We, only get to see, we don't get to run the history over again of, how, of the 2000 election. Um, and then it can also exaggerate effects uh, so that they are much stronger than the, the actual causal effect of the interests, the identities of the members of demographic groups. So this really should be a, a, uh, a warning, a loud warning to all of us that are, that are studying things with correlations that are subject to homophily and or influence such that the assumption that underlies correlation, that the observations are, are independent, does not hold. This shows just how wrong you could be. And this is a problem especially where we're using survey data and we don't know the network. But where we do know the network, uh, there's, it, this problem can become an opportunity, which is what I'm going to be turning to next. So this is just simply, I'll give you an example of one of the runs. Uh, so this just shows how this process moves from a random start into, in this case, perfect correlation uh, between opinion and whether you're a red or a blue. We get complete, um, complete polarization. And this is a slightly different experiment. Uh, here we, we have, and this is really meant uh, just as a kind of object lesson. Um, th that is to say, the, the main purpose of this is more pedagogic than, than explanatory. Uh, so here we have three binary dimensions where your, it's your opinion. You could be uh, for or against, agree, disagree, only two positions. And we, we, and we vary the number of those issues that are salient, the number of issues that people think about as they choose who to have as a neighbor and as they are influenced by, what, as they care about what their neighbors think. So we're going to increase those number of dimensions and we're going to observe how many groups we have at equilibrium. So not too surprisingly, when we have one dimension, two groups, binary dimension. That's pretty simple. Uh, two dimensions, four groups. Three dimensions, how many are we going to have? Eight. Four dimensions? Everybody here can do two to the fourth, right? 16. Five dimensions? Five dimensions? Did I hear 32? No. Eight. Six dimensions? Four. Seven or more? Back to two. Why didn't it just keep going up? Why did it collapse again? Here's what it looks like when we graph it. It's a non-monotonic effect of the number of dimensions interacting with population size. So as we increase the number of dimensions, we get more groups. But then as we keep increasing the dimensions, we drop back to just two. The thing polarizes again. So why is that? The answer is it has to do with, it has to do with black holes, cultural black holes. So we have f binary dimensions in this experiment. We have n individuals. We have two to the f possible profiles, which is what you saw happening there. So if f is much larger than n, then, then most of the profiles are, we're, are, we're going to have more, we're going to have more profiles than there are people to populate them. So we're going to have lots of cultural isolates, people who don't have anybody else with that same profile. Maybe very similar, but not, not exactly the same. And so, it's easy for these people who are not anchored by neighbors to get pulled into a larger profile. And as profiles get larger or denser, their attraction increases. And so you end up with, uh, with a very small number of profiles. You could end up with one, except that it turns out that's not reachable under the assumption that there's differentiation uh, and antipathy. Uh, it always ends up at two before it can be, before it could collapse into, a, into monoculture. Uh, so polarization is a strong tendency uh, in, in this system. 
But this also suggests a way to avoid polarization. And that is, if n is greater than 2 to the f, that is, if there are more people than profiles, now we're going to have profiles where you've got other neighbors who have exactly the same profile you do. They reinforce you and make you sticky. It's hard to move you and harder to assimilate people into, into larger profiles. And so we can then have a dissonant equilibrium, dissonant in the sense that most people have at least one neighbor who, who, to whom they have a positive relationship, but they don't agree with them on every issue. So we have what political scientists call cross-cutting cleavages, an important characteristic of a pluralistic society. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about today is how this can be disturbed by, by noise. Um, and, and what I'm going to do at the end of the talk here is sort of take you into a, uh, through the looking glass into a world in which we're going to turn upside down the way we usually think about explanation. So those of us who are familiar with the, the general linear model, the correlation is the explained variance. That's the explanat uh, explanatory part. And the error term is just, you know, that's just the residual noise which we would like to be able to, to ignore. But in the world that we're about to enter, that's upside down. The correlations now are arbitrarily positive or negative from one run to the other. So they're just random. And, uh, and yet, what we're going to show is how a small amount of noise can now make the outcomes highly predictable. So noise, instead of making the outcomes unpredictable, makes them predictable. So <clears throat> here's a simple example to show a dissonant equilibrium. There are four issues here. Issue number four has, um, has some dissonance in that the three nodes on the left agree with their enemies on this issue. They disagree on three issues, but they agree on issue number four. So that's dissonant. There's, a, there's some energy trapped in that configuration because it's not, it's not perfectly uh, polarized. And as you can see, these negative ties in green are, are a little bit weaker than the positive ties because the positive ties, they're 100%, complete agreement. The, the disagreements are, are, are moderated slightly by this agreement on, on issue four. And this is stable. Uh, the, these nodes don't change their position on four because they're anchored by, by all the other nodes in the network. So the upper left, um, yeah, the fact that, that I'm agreeing with my enemy on the right doesn't make me change that because so do my other friends also happen to agree on that issue. So I'm going to stay with that. And, that's, that's, uh, uh, and so this is an equilibrium. But it ha it's an equilibrium that, that contains energy or dissonance. So suppose that it's randomly perturbed and this node on the upper left switches from red to blue. Now what happens, we get a cascade. The, um, the neighbors of that node now also switch. And now we have an equilibrium which is more stable and has lower energy. In fact, it has zero energy. There's no dissonance anymore. And a further perturbation is not going to switch this back. It would have to switch a whole lot of nodes at once. But a, a perturbation to a single issue for a single node, it'll just flip back again. So if my slide would only work, I'm having the same problem as, as uh, as, Elbert, as uh, Laszlo had, let's see if we can, don't think it's going to work. And I don't even get to see it on, my, on mine. Uh, well, uh, at any rate, um, it's a kind of annealing process in which noise allows the system to move from a, a higher energy uh, to a lower energy state that corresponds uh, to a movement from a, locally, uh, a, a local energy minimum to a global energy minimum. And there's less variability in that outcome. Hence, the noise made the outcomes more predictable. So to sum up, uh, the tragedy of network autocorrelation is that we can have these polarizations that could occur accidentally and arbitrarily. Uh, they appear natural because we only see it happen once. We don't realize that it could just as easily have come out differently if we could rerun the process. 
And yet, although these differences are, are arbitrary in that sense, that is to say they need not be grounded in the intrinsic attributes of the members of these demographic groups. It could be, but they don't have to be. And even when they're not, they can become very strong and highly differentiated and could lead even to violent conflict. And the tragedy for, for, for scientists is that when we see this, it's hard to resist the temptation to, to conclude that they, they must have a reason for fighting. And so we look for collective interests and identities. But what we are seeing may just, and, and we will find them. We will find these correlations, guaranteed. But when we find them, it could be like seeing faces in the clouds. And we think that all the clouds will have that same face. But in fact, the next cloud that comes along can have a face pointed in the other direction. And finally, I want to conclude with the suggestion that it's, this is not really Galton's problem. This is really Galton's opportunity that we should not think of network autocorrelation as a spurious result that we somehow have to get rid of so that we can find the true explanation. There's no reason to privilege identity and interest uh, as, as explanatory factors. Um, it's not just network autocorrelation is not just a, a confound that has to be ruled out. It's actually uh, a, a very powerful way of explaining conflict that we should uh, that we should pursue. And on that note, I will end and invite any questions you might have. Yes. I'm wondering if you explored. Um, sorry, this reminds me very much. Right, another mic. All right, this reminds me very. Okay, this. Oh, thank you. This this reminds me of uh, models of urban economics, where you get, um, or neighborhood economics, where you get polarization across neighborhoods, and there's a strain in that literature. And your models are completely consistent with that. There's a strain in that literature that. Um, includes an additional uh, uh, mechanism that you don't have, and I'm wondering if you explored it. The additional mechanism is uh, a taste for diversity, it's, uh, or a, 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 you know, a taste. Uh, Richard Florida has sort of popularized this idea of taste for art artists have a taste for diversity, um, and, and so on. And, and the consequence of that is it sucks every, everybody with that taste into a small number of places. And it uh, has the consequences for the others. Have you looked into yes. things like that? Yes, absolutely. That very nice point. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned the fact that network autocorrelation is, is a part of a family that economists have studied really very carefully. Spatial autocorrelation, temporal autocorrelation. But you know, we're, we're networks, so here it's network autocorrelation. But it's really not the, only, not the only flavor. And economists, I think, have actually done the best work in trying to figure out how, uh, what to do with this and how to, how to handle it. Um, uh, other social scientists, a little bit of a tendency to, to be whistling in the dark, pretending that IID is satisfied, that, that observations are, are independent and identically distributed, even though we really know that they rarely are, uh, unless it's, yeah, it's pretty unusual, they would be. Pardon? Yes, it, uh, absolutely right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. This is not an issue. It's absolutely right. Um, and in fact, to just to get to your, your real question here, the follow-up, uh, I'm actually not a co-author on it, but the, my, my co-author group has an, uh, a paper that they just did. Um, and, and in that paper, they're trying to explain, uh, so how do you get, uh, how do you avoid polarization in monoculture? Um, and, and they, 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 they focus on exactly that concept. And that's actually the phrase they use, uh, a taste for diversity. And actually, the precursors of that are some papers. There's a paper by Kathleen Carley uh, going way back to the 1980s, and then by uh, Noah Mark uh, in sociology that used somewhat similar models and also introduced this idea of invention uh, and, and just adopting something new. So it's a, in a really important direction for people to work in. Yes, Ron. Um, 
I'd like to take advantage, I don't know the Damon Centola paper in 2010, and the economic analyses I've seen of the, ah, I think the Framingham uh, data use different criterion variables to sort of dump on one another. So um, Christakis and Fowler show all these effects, weighty people becoming weightier by hanging out with other weighty people. Um, but then the uh, Cohen and Fletcher piece in 208 shows that height has the same effect. <laughs> that if you hang out with tall people, you get tall. Yeah. Um, and, and I think so dandruff, sort of a dandruff is contagious, it turns yeah. out, and uh, uh, acne. Uh, and, 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 yeah. But here's the, the question. Has anyone run tests that purport a method that recover certain kinds of contagious variables but show no contagion in obviously wrong contagion variables? So they would show no contagion in height but high contagion in whatever is contagious. Yes, the person that was sitting right next to you, but where has he gone? Uh, so Sanan so Aral has, has so a... So this next paper, so this next is a segue into the next stay paper. Stay tuned. Actually, he's not presenting that paper today. I thought he, I thought he would because of the topic. I thought it would be perfect for this. Okay. He's presenting a different one, and we should actually wrap this up so he can present it. But I think, that, I think his, his paper is the best that I've seen at, at working on this, at addressing this problem. But they're, they're, yes, there we go. I will stand up for Christakis and Fowler. Good. They are actually are very aware of the, quote, causal, uh -huh. unquote, implications of what they're doing. And they would be the first ones to say, wow, we're doing the best we can with the available statistical yep. methods with these data, primarily from Framingham, but they have lots of simulation studies and other data sets as well. They're doing what they can with the available data and you know, I think it's remarkable. I think the data sets are incredible. I think their techniques work. Here, here. Okay? Here, here. I, yeah. I, I, but, I agree 100%. Again, I really appreciate you saying Again, that. I, I, you're talking about causation here with observational data, which is a huge issue. Yep. And we can argue from a statistical viewpoint that you just can't. Yeah, and in some ways that's another segue to the next talk because I think that, that uh, and I'm pretty sure Sanan will agree with this, on, that, ex that controlled experiments, that really is the way to address uh, all of these problems actually. Every one of these problems that I've raised with causal inference, including network autocorrelation. Um, so uh, if you, so if you were to make the Facebook, yes, I just, somebody, somebody has to turn it up. Hello? Yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. well, well, it's supposed to proceed without being recorded. But um, yeah, so the, this is so. This is I find this personally just so motivating because that's the you know the polarization. It's, it's the problem. It's the problem with the world. So it's, it's, it seems to be more of a problem. It's accidental. More, uh, but from those from the, the the blogosphere sort of charts, it seems to be more of a problem with the the red blue polarization seems to be particularly American problem. Uh, there may be other polarizations elsewhere, but for example, the, the French Sunni language Shia. didn't show it, did, didn't demonstrate it. I thought that the, the um, uh, uh, who's the guy who who, sh who went around and demonstrated that of the people in the the pa uh, was the paper called what was uh, what what's wrong with Kansas or something? Where he went and looked at the election and found that there was hmm? it was uh, mm -hmm. so he, so he found that the when you when you f the found the, there was a set of people who could not imagine having a black person as a president, and they were a subset of the people who had never ever worked or lived with somebody of a different mm -hmm. ethnic background. So in a way, uh, so you know, the, the, obviously the sixty-four thousand dollar question is when. So what can you do to fix this? And uh, now, of course, so the, so that paper suggested. Everybody should be shipped off after high school or in the middle of high school to see at least one person of another color and work with them for at least one week. And maybe that would give them a taste for diversity. I don't know. But, uh, uh, but now we have maybe uh, you could do some more subtle things. So what, uh, how would you change Facebook? For example? You know, can you think about how, to how you could change Facebook, which would... Uh, rand which would could, uh, so I've wondered, I've suggested that, that uh, the friend finder thing should stop, suggest, sh shouldn't just give you... Uh, people, people who are friends of friends, but every now and again, it should throw in a wobbly. It should throw in somebody who's, uh, I'd call a stretch friend. Yeah. Andreas <laughs> Walker, my, my co-author. How, many, how many stretch friends do you have to throw in on average in order to mm -hmm. actually uh, to tip it back and, and make, it, uh, make, make, uh, make the differences dissolve instead? 
Uh, my, my co-author, Andreas Flaka, uh, studied this question. He got a grant from the Dutch National Science Foundation, collected data from schools in the Netherlands. And, and sadly, he found that, that small amounts of contact with outgroups actually made things worse. I think this. I think you're absolutely right that people designing web tools and 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 uh, and applications should be. It would be useful to be thinking about uh, what are the kinds of tools that can address these polarizing tendencies in effective ways. There is this tendency for people who agree with CNN to watch CNN, who agree with Fox News to watch Fox News. The web may be a way to break this up, but people are going to have to think carefully about how to design tools that will help to do that. Uh, Rob. Uh, just to follow on from Tim's question, I mean, to the extent that, I'll comment, to the extent that the semantic web is about improving the searchability of the web, and I'm just making a very basic summarization, I mean, is, is there a risk that the uh, semantic web technologies will actually increase narrow casting and increase uh, this tendency, or you know, the ability for people to find like-minded people and therefore increase homophily? It's not that the semantic web is about search. <laughs> it's about moving away from search. You know, it's about to, uh, apart from sort of take out, remove that meme. Semantic web is not a way to make search better. Uh, it's something different. Um, but obviously, uh, if you can, uh, if you have a lot of, in, instead of having just tag data, you actually have hard semantic data, and you want to listen to, and you only want to listen to people who are. Uh, of your who are very similar on you know have the same uh, ethnic background the same race color creed uh, sexual orientation and so on boy if you've got it that, that is sort of data which you can just simply put through a filter uh, which is going to be 100 percent reliable then yes it's a little bit frightening uh, but so, um, but I think but it doesn't seem as though it's not as though polishing these you know uh, all the setup that we have at the moment seems to be with all the the uh, in, very inefficient uh, systems of filtering we have, which are in fact dramatic, in a lot of cases really dramatically inefficient, and throw in lots of serendipity, still it leads to this horrendous and absolutely extreme polarization. But so I, I don't I, think it, so I don't think the, 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 if the semantic web gives us more finer tools which allow us to more fil carefully filter, I don't think that's the issue. I think it's more careful of really maybe just uh, of going in and affecting the neural of trying to Get, get understand the neurology of individual people and working out why they behave like that and figure out whether we have to... Uh, I think one of, the, one of the lessons here today is that the, the object here is not to get people to compromise or agree with each other or take more modern positions. It's to have more dissonant equilibria, to, to have equilibria that traps high levels of energy, high levels of dissonance, which is, I think, probably, I don't, I don't have the cognitive science knowledge to back this up, but my intuition is that it's probably good for people to have to hold these dissonant positions and have dissonance with their neighbors. And I, I think that's the, the idea, is to be able to, how do you, tr how do you store energy in the system and, and prevent that from getting squeezed out? It's not how do you get homogeneity, compromise, agreement, moderation. It's how you get difference and, and tolerance of difference, not at the psychological sense, but in the, both in the psychological and in the structural sense. Well, that, so if you talk about energy, mm -hmm. as though there is an effort, effort put in, <laughs> people have to put in, to get to this and have to make, uh, uh, and, and to maintain it. Presumably, alternatively, you add other uh, other energy factors. So you you you, uh, you affect other things, or like how much food or money or sex they get. Yeah. You know, so, mm -hmm. so you, you make that correlate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so that in fact, could end up assuming that individual people will always, always go for the lower energy, mm -hmm. then you need to so you need to change the. I mean, the energy here is a little bit of a, 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 an analogy that is sort of borrowed from the physics literature. So the energy is really dissonance. Uh, and um, so in, from an, kind of an annealing standpoint, uh, we can think of the noise as helping to, to lower the energy state of the, of the social uh, fabric. Uh, right, we're, we're, so yeah. so one, one interesting point uh, listening to your talk is, is this idea about how you like to be with, with people, in this case, that are like you, but also there seems to be the important aspect in your model of being different from someone else. Mm -hmm. So dislike yeah. is also very strong. And that seems to be very powerful if you think about yeah. speciation w yeah. within ecology and, and species the same species kind of subdividing because of some characteristic. And so this seems to be very, very 
fundamental. And maybe I'm, I shouldn't be trying to summarize what my what the take home message from your talk is. But as you were talking about, I was thinking that what is so relevant is the fact that because this is such a natural tendency, mm -hmm. even in the absence of causes for it, it really raises the question of the need if we want to counter it, that we actually have to work actively yeah. about it, right? If yeah. we want to avoid polarization, if we want to avoid segregation, it's not like we can wait that everything is going to work out, is that you'll have to, because the forces are so strong, have to act. You got the take-home message. I mean, in some ways, if this is, I think, the equivalent of, of the role that self-interest plays in economics models. This is saying, no, no, there's something even more fundamental, and, and it's exactly what, what you're pointing to. And it may turn out that self-interest helps to prevent this, uh, that as appeals to self-interest may help to offset this tendency toward, uh, toward antipathy, toward those who are different, and, and a kind of psychophant association with those who are similar. I have to say, when I was listening to the debate in the last, at the end of the last talk about, you know, is it theory driven, is it data driven, I, it was going through my mind, is this just a religious conflict? Uh, in which the position that you're taking on this, one, one or the other, to what extent is that a consequence of the positions of your network neighbors or maybe disciplinary neighbors? So I think this is a, a really universal phenomena that affects everyone. Uh, and it may be that self-interest is actually a way to help attenuate this. Okay, stimulating discussion, but yep. we need to move to the next talk. So let's thank Michael one more time. <laughs>